Right, you got any final questions? Yeah, yeah, of course. I appreciate you sharing that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I'm intimately involved in that type of conversation. Yeah, at another point, we'll have to get you in to another interview and <laughs> speaking about this too. <laughs> but, um, all right, so. Oh, really? Oh, I see. Gotcha. Amazing. All right, so, yeah, I got, got it. Yeah, now we're no, we're about to start. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Now I'm going to show. All right. So, also in regards to what you were sharing there about kind of just your background, how it played into your career, could you then speak about how um, sustainability and everything that you learned during your time at MIU played a role into then, you know, what you ended up doing for uh, for your career and for YouTube and. Um, how anything that you've learned there has really played a huge role. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so obviously as somebody who does like plant-based vegan, whatever YouTubing, where I generally have an environmental message in a good portion of my, of my videos. First of all, being in school, I had the, obviously the environmental motivation and understanding that. And then of course, if you've heard about plant-based eating or whatever, you know, a large, a large portion of people have an environmental motivation. Know, 70 billion actually now 80 billion land animals killed per year and you know the carbon emissions depending on what FAO report you're looking at 15 to 18 percent of all emissions um, and so we have that and I actually remember back in when I was in school we, everyone was on the Alan Savory thing so it was, oh cattle will save the world but then you know looking deeper into that and some of the research people are still on that so people probably weren't, are going to want to argue with me about that immediately after saying that um, but you know learning more about methane emissions and stuff like that it's it's that was a huge motivator for me at least in addition to you know what I did for health and for the animals we also have just the creative production aspect of it as well so we were creating videos again I, was, I recently just mentioned making the YouTube video about the bike trailer and then we also did like a 3d again redesign of the um, local pool to be a natural swimming pool things like that I was already doing these media related projects so I was like man hmm, maybe I should just start making some videos so that's what I did like in an apartment nine years ago in Chicago and then now I've luckily been able to get a, a large following and travel all over the world and keep doing all the scientific research because really my channel is just citing science essentially so yeah just those two things coming together caring about the environment and then caring about animals as well I will say that spiritual aspect mm. um, because of, of that I was raised not eating certain animals like red meat and Set around having a lot of vegetarian friends and making fun of them mm. being like a, a teenager and stuff when I was more immature and so now I understand why people have the impulse to be like oh you know stupid vegan or you know I'll eat twice as many animals now or chicken or chicken or vegetables with with legs etc which is what I used to say so you know I understand both perspectives um, but you know now years later been lucky you know have that background making creative content in school and then understanding and having that motivation like we need to do something about the climate right now and then putting that science together and then that's all just turned into my youtube channel mm -hmm. that's, that's how, yeah, that went. that's perfect and and then mark i think that actually brings up a good point if you could go into the science and uh of spirituality and sustainability course that you're going to be teaching later on this year and maybe how um any of that could tie into to what was discussed here today or just like kind of just giving a brief introduction about it and maybe any of the other courses that are coming up later on this year sure yeah well um you know as i said before i used to think of sustainability mostly as a technological matter that you know we're going to engineer our way out of uh, out of kind of the climate crisis and uh, you know all the other things we're facing and you know that is still to some extent true and you know as Mike says we we really we have everything we need to do it except maybe the, the will and uh, but as far as technology goes I mean you know we're we're basically there at least we could be but um when you look at the long history of human so 
social and political interactions. Um, you know, I really have reason to doubt that we can even get along with each other as a species. Uh, you know, never mind uh, the destruction we're doing to other species and all that. You know, really, uh, if you take a historical view or perspective on that, you know, it's just, it's hard to imagine a, a peaceful society. And yet, you know, so many of us just want that so desperately. And uh, so I think that's really the heart of sustainability is uh, this idea that, you know, maybe we individually and, you know, perhaps collectively as a species can evolve into some kind of state of empathy where I think empathy is, is the key word here. And empathy is a spiritual word. It's, uh, means that you have the wherewithal, the maturity and everything to put yourself in other people's shoes and to, um, you know, understand, like in the case of animals, just the, the cruelty of that system that as it is now, in particular with capos, the way that is, mm -hmm. and to be able to empathize with that and to understand that you know, animals are conscious feeling beings. I'm kind of rambling here, I guess, but, um, oh, you're good. you know, that's as far as coming up with a connection between spirituality and sustainability. Yeah, I think spirituality is fundamental to the whole thing, mm. and it's, uh, it's what will motivate us, if anything will, to be kind to each other and to other species and to preserve the environment and to appreciate the natural world. And I've structured my life these days on spending as much time as I can in the natural world because that's where my that's where I derive my my spiritual outlook. It's from being in the desert, in the mountains, in the ocean, and uh, and all of that. And uh, you know, I'm at the point where I I cannot live without that connection to nature. It's, uh, uh, that's uh, that's what I do these days. I, been very lucky and well partly lucky and partly resourceful in that now I have um, uh, tiny houses all over the place in different mm. climates. We have one in the desert, we have one in the mountains, and we have one in the prairie, and then I have a sailboat uh, on the ocean. And so, um, you know, my next few years here is just going to be to go from place to place to immerse myself in nature as much as I can and just see see what happens as a result of that. See how I grow and develop in my ability to perceive and to empathize and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I do have a little bit of comment. You, yeah. you can delete it later if you don't want it. But as you say, I think it was interesting how you're saying empathy and spirituality are sort of two sides of the same coin. And we've been looking at technology and I would say, again, technology doesn't look like it's gonna be the solution on its own. But I would say if, like the only hope that technology has left of solving it is if somehow technology can be used to persuade people to have empathy. <laughs> mm. And that's that's like the last hope because, you know, otherwise, you know, again, if there's no will, then there's definitely gonna be no way. We're definitely not gonna get it done. We have the technology. We have, you know, maybe one argument you could say is we have the technology to do it. Maybe if technology gets even better and it's so cheap to do it that maybe we, we could help a little bit more in that way but like yeah it's clear that technology alone is not enough and so if we can spread empathy and <laughs> spread motivation to uh, fix our climate issue right now then uh yeah that would be a big win <laughs> mm. oh yeah and one one other thing i should mention too and that is just uh, you know my long-term involvement with transcendental meditation i learned when i was 16 i was in 1972 and meditating twice a day um, ever since. And I really have to credit um, that with um, my ability to evolve as a, as a person and to, uh, you know, the old uh, saying, know thyself, just to get to know myself to the point where um, I don't think I have 
I think so many of the problems of the world is that people are so snarled up by not knowing themselves and knowing their motivations. And, mm -hmm. You know, you have this idea of this murky unconscious where, you know, it's like, where did that come from? And, go, 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 uh, go hang out. Yes, I can always be the storehouse the of, uh, if I you know, of uh, anger and rage and, uh, and uh, you know, psychopathic tendencies and all that stuff. Well, after meditating for about 50 years, I think uh, I think that's pretty much gone. I just don't. I don't even feel that like I have uh, an unconscious or subconscious anymore. It just seems like it's it's all conscious, and that is actually a lovely state to be in. It's just it's it's comfortable. It's blissful. It's been worth it. Mm -hmm. And I would say, okay, fine, one last thing. Yeah. I would say, yeah, self-awareness is huge, and I feel like being aware of people's own, your own motivations as well, whether it's through meditation or, like, <laughs> cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever, just to, or even just, you know, speaking with a professional or, or just dissecting yourself a little bit and your motivations is huge. And I think about how that affects the climate. I mean, when I get cut off by some guy here in his lifted truck, his coal rolling, which, by the way, is illegal, uh, according to the EPA, um, why, why are they doing that? You know, it's some personal insecurity, how they were, you know, maybe their dad said they didn't throw the ball hard enough or whatever and, and stuff like that. And then soon they're, you know, they have this complex and then that's on an individual level what we see happening. And then we also need to be self-aware as a collective because even entire countries have that sort of like coal rolling mentality as that guy had of like, just totally insecure, totally trying to flex. You know, we're talking about these dictators like, you know, between Vladimir Putin and Kim, Kim Jong-un, whatever we 